Hello, and thank you for joining us at the Forbes Next 1000 Timeless Strategies to Evolve Amidst an Ever-Shifting Market, presented by Square. If you scroll down below the video player, you will see the Next 1000 virtual photo booth. Strike a pose and tag us on social, hashtag Next 1000. We are excited to have you be a part of the conversation. You can submit questions for our speakers through Slido by clicking the Join the Conversation button located at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen or by going to slido.com from your mobile device and entering the event code hashtag next1000. It is important that you enter your first and last name for a chance to be entered in our giveaway, which we will hear more about at the end of today's event. Now, please welcome Randall Lane, Chief Content Officer, Forbes. All right, we're back and working and thrilled you're joining us for the first ever Forbes Next 1000 event. I'm Randall Lane, Editor and Chief Content Officer here at Forbes. We launched the Next 1000 initiative in the middle of 2020 to spotlight the massive landscape of 30 million American small businesses hustling in the shadows of the unicorn startups that typically attract media attention. These enterprises were some of the hardest hit by the pandemic. And so we wanted to tell the story of the sole proprietorships, the pre-revenue startups, the, the, the firms that are redefining the American dream, the stories of the most entrepreneurial entrepreneurs in America. They're self-reliant, self-funded, self-driven professionals. Many of them people of color or women or LGBTQ individuals. The country's most successful black entrepreneur, Robert Smith, brought to my attention last year a staggering statistic. More than 90% of black owned businesses are sole proprietorships. So under the incredible leadership of Manita Huja, the senior editor for small business here at Forbes, we sketched a plan for how to bring these businesses into the spotlight using our print and digital and live platforms as a megaphone. We welcome nominations for this new package called Next 1000 and it received well over 5,000 nominations and counting. And nominations are still open. We require candidates to have a proven business operational for at least one year with under $10 million in revenue or funding but infinite drive and infinite hustle. Manit recruited an A-list lineup of judges who have passionately helped us review these candidates. Thank you to the judges, including Alex Rodriguez, Cheryl Sandberg, Russell, Russell Wilson of Sierra, Lily Singh, Reed Hoffman, Aisha Curry, Eileen Lee, Melody Hobson, Jean Case, Carla Harris, and so many more. This year, we are releasing a list of 1,000 in four segments. Last, year, last month, we released the 200, first 250 names on Forbes.com. And in that first release, 62% of the honorees identify as female, 20% identify as black. And this summer, our print issue will carry the theme, inclusive capitalism and focus on the types of businesses and business people who historically haven't made the pages of Forbes magazine. The next 1000 list will be a tentpole story inside that issue. We're, recognize, we're recognizing the doers doing it their own way, overcoming any and all obstacles to get there. These types of journeys tend to prove the most inspiring and in finding them, we hope to elevate a new class of super achievers. Today, you'll have the opportunity to learn and hear from some of the standouts among our first group of next 1000 honorees. I implore you to pay attention, to ask questions and engage using Slido. These speakers have, be, have been able to create, pivot and grow their businesses in new and dynamic ways. And a special thank you to Square for not only being our partner of this year's list, but also for the events. Thank you again to our phenomenal judges. And last but never least, thank you to all the teams that were able to bring this list and this event to life, and all of you for spending a few hours with us today to learn and be inspired. Now for our first session, Breaking Barriers in Beauty, please welcome Deepika Mutiala, Founder and CEO, Live Tinted, and interviewer, Manit Ahuja, Senior Editor, Forbes. Thank you so much, Randall, for that awesome welcome, and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Many of you in the audience are undoubtedly fans of our first speaker and Next 1000 honoree, so let's dive right in. Deepika, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm honored. We, we are honored as well. So as a beauty influencer, you rose to fame in 2015 after you posted a YouTube video on how to cover under eye circles with red lipstick that hit over 10 million views. 
overnight, practically, you hit the media circuit on national TV shows like the Today Show and Dr. Oz, and that launched your beauty influence career, something you said you always knew you wanted to do. So I would love to start off and help our audience know a little bit more about your story and why this was such a passion of yours and what white space you saw that you wanted to fill. Yeah, um, thank you for asking that question. I think I'm back in Texas now. I moved here during the pandemic from LA and it really brings things full circle for me because it takes me back to the girl who grew up here and dyed her hair blonde and got blue contacts to fit into the standards of beauty that I saw all around me. And so um, when I was on this mission, I literally told my parents at 16 years old who wanted me to go be a doctor that I was going to create a beauty brand that represented for people who look like me. Um, the path to getting there went a little different. Like I did not, you know, who you can't plan for a viral video, um, but it was always my plan. I always wanted to create a brand for people who look like me. And I think since then to now, after working on the corporate side of the beauty industry, being a beauty influencer, I recognized there was this white space to create this sort of collective home and community for people who haven't seen themselves represented across the whole spectrum. And so rather than it just being for people who look like me, it's finally inclusive of people who look like me, but really creating this community first beauty brand that really was listening to people who were just craving to be seen. And so that's that's really kind of what Live Tinted was birthed as. And Live Tinted is called Live Tinted intentionally. We all have a tint to our skin. And I want this to be a place where everyone kind of comes together and realizes we have more in common than we realize. And you said um, that your path to getting here was a little bit unconventional, right? I think I had seen in one of your YouTube videos that all you wanted in college was an internship at L'Oreal. And you found out later that it was exactly because you didn't get that opportunity that you were able to launch your business, which isn't typically the norm, right? I mean, I had such a plan. I was going to work at L'Oreal, be a brand manager, go to Harvard Business School and make my parents super happy and then launch my own beauty brand. Um, when they didn't give me an offer, <laughs> kind of threw things off for me. Um, and, but it ended up being the best blessing. Because of that, I ended up working at Birchbox. I was a very early employee there, which was disrupting the beauty and tech space at the time. So I got to work with two incredible female founders, smart women, driven be in the beauty industry. I learned so much from that. And also the thing that was the most incredible from that experience was building an, a network that was invaluable. And so I took a pay cut to go work at Birchbox and all these other things, but it didn't matter. In my early twenties, all I was focused on was experience and networking and, and learning and soaking in as much as I could. Um, and while I was there was when I saw this rise of influencer marketing and it was just like, what is this thing? And we're paying these people how much to do what? Like, it was just very odd, the whole thing. Um, but what I really realized is it's the new billboard. And if you're not going to get on board and, and adapt with it, then you're going to fall behind. And so in 2015, I just picked up my phone, held it vertically instead of horizontally, was scrappy. And that video went viral and it forever changed my life. Yeah, and that's just such a good lesson because the path to entrepreneurship is never is rarely straight and narrow. And so your path from influencer to founder, I find fascinating, right? So you did that from 2015 to 2018, launched a huge career based off of that video and your face in the marketplace. And in 2018, you launched, as you said, Live Tinted officially creating a community for your followers and a product offerings designed for um, people of color in mind. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? And when did you realize you were actually building a community? Yeah, I know it's a great question. And even when I went to investors in the early days trying to fundraise, they like didn't understand why I felt the need to create a community that was larger than myself because their thought process was, well, you're already an influencer. You spent three years building a brand around yourself and all true for sure. But I just felt like the larger issue of representation needed to be seen in a much more 360 way and not just from my voice, but a collective of voices. Um, and so, yeah, I would say 90% of the investors I pitched didn't believe in that. And they were like, that sounds like a waste of money. And for me, this was bigger than 
money, you know, you have to have a business. So like, yes, we needed to have revenue, but this like genuinely feels like my purpose, like truly like being again, like back in Texas, I'm like looking around me and I'm like, wow, things are really changing. And it takes people actively recognizing and doing things, even if some investors or people around you say not to do it, you got to go with your gut feeling and recognize that sometimes it's not just about the fiscal success, but also just the, what you want your footprint to be in the world. And, and for me, I just wanted it to be so the next generation grew up not feeling what I did and um, that they saw themselves represented in an industry that traditionally didn't show them. Yeah, so it really was that sense of the community that drove you. But did you ever, in your gut, did you have a feeling that Live Tinted would grow to be such a huge business? Or was it kind of something that you thought, okay, this might be a side project. I'm really focusing on the community first. Well, definitely when we started as a community platform, it was like, you never know. Like when you actually launch a product, if people, it'll stick. But I will say... I didn't focus on perfection the same way that with the viral video, I wasn't focused on the quality of it. And I just posted on my personal Instagram stories. I said, like, can you tag deeper skin, melanated South Asian women um, using hashtag lip tinted? I'm not kidding. Beneath within minutes, there were hundreds of tags because people were just wow. dying to be seen. And that to me already was like, oh my gosh, like hashtag lip tinted it like within six months had 50,000 people using the hashtag and it became wow. this movement. And I just was like, oh my gosh, this is before product. And it really just showed me that people are just craving to be seen. And I feel like for me, the way I saw it was even if this business doesn't um, net out to where I thought it was at when I was 16 years old, it's actually building something way more meaningful and incredible. And so We've definitely been moving slower in terms of like releasing products because there's so much thought that goes into it. Like nobody needs another eyeliner or like a lip gloss or an eyeshadow palette, I think in a world where there's a gajillion, but if there's some a meaning and a purpose behind it, then it just feels that much more um, genuine and true to Lip Tinted. Wow. Yeah, that's so fascinating because I actually have been hearing that story a lot that like it started with a social media campaign. The ambition was small. It wasn't to be perfect, but it was just to get started. And it was driven by this like mission to really make an impact to be seen. So it's really interesting that you say that. And on that point, right, you started Lip Tinted in 2018. I'm a little bit surprised. I mean, I am a South Asian American woman myself and a beauty consumer, obviously, but that was just like two years ago. And to think that there really weren't products out there for people um, with melanin skin tone. So on that point, diversity in the beauty industry has been something that's been an issue for a long time. And more recently, brands like Fenty and Too Faced have launched their own collaborations and expanded lines. But in watching your documentary, you had said that you didn't really see yourself in those advertisements. What did you feel like was still missing that needed to be done better? um real life you know there was a lot of really intense makeup and uh and, and don't get me wrong i'm so grateful for brands like Fenty who have actually paved this path of making it so inclusivity is sort of the standard um and people are now following suit which is incredible i still didn't see myself i still didn't see a south asian girl who's an everyday girl who's not a makeup enthusiast who just wanted to feel good when she walked out the door Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, even in when I'm, I'm looking at, I'm in my office right now and the women that I'm looking at as the faces that we envision, I remember we did this exercise where we were literally putting 70 to a hundred photos on the floor that we found on the internet. And if somebody was a deeper skinned complexion person, they were not smiling. They were just very like serious and honestly looked kind of like sad. And so I always just envisioned that when we launched Lip Tinted, it brought joy, it brought uh, like happiness and people were smiling in this industry. They weren't Photoshopped and they were really wearing what people actually wear in their day-to-day -day life. You know, it wasn't the like about the 50 layers of makeup, which is also like great. And I love to do that every once in a while. But for me, Lip Tinted was about embracing your hues and your um, unique features that make you, you, because that was the exact opposite of what I did growing up. Wow, that's such an interesting observation now that you mention it, right? It's like the seriousness in brand campaigns, especially when we're seeing skin tones like ours. It's, it's not our day-to-day -day life. So that's so 
interesting that you found that out. And I also will say in terms of diversity, I'm so grateful that, you know, you are seeing more representation, but it's always been tokenized. It's always been your token black girl, your token brown girl, your token, you know, and and for me, it was really important in our very first campaign that you saw multiple brown women, multiple black women, mixed women. And, and we didn't have many dollars, but we made it work because we actually had the community be our models. And they were just so excited to actually see themselves represented that again, like it wasn't this really crisp campaign, but it was a heartfelt campaign and people felt that. And I think that's attributed a lot to our success. Yeah, that's such a smart business idea too, right? And like one of the other questions I was going to ask you later in the conversation was about brand loyalty and you already had that built in. So it's like you're being cost effective and you're actually featuring your customers. Um, and on that point, uh, uh, switching over to the pandemic, since last year was such a challenging year for small business owners or you know, even CEOs and major corporations, but I've noticed in talking to um, CEOs and founders of beauty businesses that it's been a little bit of a different experience for them specifically. What has it been like for you to build and run a beauty empire amidst the pandemic? I know you were at a very interesting inflection point heading into the pandemic where you had a lot of early success already and important conversations and product uh, development. What happened, you know, a year ago and, and how did you pivot because of that? Well, right when the pandemic hit, um, we were sold out of 90% of our SKUs. I went on Good Morning America and it was like, you know, it's a blessed problem. We sold out of 90% of our SKUs, but when manufacturers are shut down, then you really don't have a business. <laughs> so <laughs> that wasn't great, um, but it forced us to get creative. And it also forced us to focus on other parts of the business that we were kind of neglecting. Like even just coming from the startup land, I'm so used to just going, 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 going. And this pandemic, I think everyone can say it forced us to slow down and take a step back and recognize, are we hiring for the right roles? Like um, what was also cool was we stopped having an HQ. So we started to hire people from all parts of the country and opened up the talent pool. And um, I think I, the other thing I'll say is I'm very grateful that um, we didn't go into a retailer. I intentionally wanted to move slow with that decision. I wanted us to stay a community first and really dictate the SKUs and the products that we launch. And I've seen too many brands rush into retailers because of the, so many reasons, right? Of course, sales being omni-channel is important, but I didn't want to rush in just because of the um, wow factor of it. Because to me, this brand is about being a legacy brand that hopefully outlives me. This is not like a quick thing for me. And, and I think taking my time and going slow in a world of social media where it feels like you have to rush everything, um, constantly reminding myself that I have my own journey and this journey is unique to me has calmed me. And you know, the, the phrase, it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint really got me through it too. I was like, everyone's going through this, make the most of it. What can we do to really pivot and, and really focus on other parts of our business? And honestly, focus on, I'm such a workaholic. It forced me to take a step back and recognize what is all this success for if we're not doing it with people, our loved ones close by. So part of the reason I moved back to Texas. Yeah. So you're with your family, right? I've been keeping track on your YouTube videos. So you're um, with, with your parents and your sister, right? Yeah. And my new nephew, who is the best. And so you, I, I just have to focus in on that and recognize that this is just a blip in the road. And it's, mm -hmm. if we didn't hit our sales goal last year, but like we survived. So who cares? And, you know, it's, it's, it's just a journey. And I, you, I, I just have to choose to focus on the positive of it all, but it isn't easy. Also, because like now there's other people's livelihoods on the line, right? Like now right. as a CEO, it's not just about me and my dream. There's employees in place. And so that pressure was probably what consumed me the most is like, wow, like people chose to live their like lives with this company. I have a responsibility to like maintain that. Um, and that pressure honestly consumed me a lot and had kept like a lot of sleepless nights. Um, mm -hmm. And there's just things that we did, like, you know, I don't pay myself a salary, things like that. You just have to do that as a leader in a business to really make sure that you're taking care of the company. But um, it, it wasn't easy. <laughs> definitely, definitely wasn't. But now that we're hopefully on the other side of the pandemic, how are you thinking about that retail versus web division of, you know, how you want to reach your customers? Are you reigniting those conversations with retailers? You know, people are hopefully returning to the office in the fall. We're seeing more people get vaccinated. As a CEO, how are you thinking about like 
how that business should be focused? Well, one thing I realized and I'm really grateful for is that since day one, we've been focusing on profitability rather than fast growth. And Mm -hmm. now that we like really dissect the numbers, I've noticed that I'm really grateful, especially going into conversations with potential investors. Um, They really value that because, you know, there was such a period of growth where people were just spending on ads on Facebook and things like that, that when you take a, when you take the layers back in the business, are they actually doing it in a profitable way? And so that's one thing that I've been able to really appreciate and see and now realize we are set up to go into a retailer. And yeah, I had a call with the one we're going with right before this, the contract isn't signed. So until it is, I don't want to jinx it, but I will always say that omni-channel is the way to go. I, I really think it's like the world that we were in in the heydays of Glossier and um, mm-hmm. some other beauty brands who really thrived on um, direct to consumer only. I also think there's something to that in-person experience. And so mm-hmm. um, I think I'm really excited about that expansion, but we're always going to be community first. And we made that very clear to our retail partner and, going to continue to grow our direct-to-consumer business as well. I'm sure they appreciate that. But on that point, on social, with over 4.2 billion social media users around the world, many smart businesses, small businesses, smartly flock to digital presences, um, especially as they were forced to shut down in the pandemic. And there was actually research that showed that businesses that did pivot saw a 400% increase in revenue as compared to those that didn't. Still, many businesses are still lagging in this regard, especially small businesses, which many of which had been brick and mortar. What guidance would you give as somebody who was digital and community first to those that are starting out launching a web presence? Where is the most important place for them to start? Well, I think it is subjective to each business, but I would say if I was blanket statement and if you're taking your bets and you're trying to grow your business quick, I would spend my time and effort on TikTok. Mm -hmm. Um, that's what we're doing. And I think it's for us, it's tapping into Gen Z. So we're really excited about it. Instagram growth across the board from all founders I've been speaking to has been stagnant. And, um, it's, it's one of those things that it's like, let's be an early adapter before we're, before it's too late. And we're not that early adapter. And I will always say whatever you can do to make it so your business is not dependent on other outlets and really nurture that, like community first attitude and doing things that sometimes are not focused, like I said, on the fiscal financial benefits of the business, but the person behind the, um, behind the product, like who is buying the products. And it's tough because it's a balance. You're like, Oh wait, I have to make money. Like, let's be real. We're trying to run a business here, but I find that that loyalty we've been able to create with live tinted and that ride or die mentality of like, whatever you're buying, I'm, I'm whatever you're creating, I'm buying comes from the fact that we cared since day one. And so um, now, of course, to grow from, you know, let's be real, like the first two years of the business has been a lot from my own audience and slowly Mm -hmm. expanding. Now we need new channels to grow our audiences. Um, I'm really excited about TikTok. And also the world, everyone's just craving some joy right now. It's like, there's so much going on and TikTok just feels way more lighthearted and happy. And um, that to me, at least is where I've been seeing the best um, in terms of use of energy and time for the team. All right, great. Well, I know we only have a minute or two left, but I had an important question from the audience. You mentioned that you are meeting with investors now, and so you very might likely be in the fundraising process. Here's a question from the audience. How do I find funding to expand my business in South LA? I'm not saying it has an easy answer, but I just want to give an opportunity to the audience to participate. I will say, if if I can say one quick soundbite, I I would just say, don't get caught up in the luster and the sexiness of fundraising because going through it now, it's the exact opposite of that. And you're giving away a piece of your business. If you can self-fund, keep doing that as long as possible, but there is a point where you have to grow and that's where we're at. Um, Bringing in strategic angels before you go to any VC, I think I encourage everyone to go and try to do that because they're going to believe in your vision through the ups and downs, through pandemics and all these other things versus other people who have a responsibility to grow your business to the people they have to answer to. So the best, as much as you can go to individuals, um, the better. Mm -hmm. That's a great piece of advice. So final last two questions. If you could leave our audience with just one piece of advice, maybe not on the fundraising side, but overall broadly, what would it be? Um, you know, I, this is what's top of mind for me being somebody who is very social media in the world and stuff. It is so hard to not see everyone else around you and feel like you're moving too slow. Um, constantly seeing people post about their wins. 
first of all, I encourage everyone to show the raw and real of what's happening because we're all struggling. We're all going through it in day to day as humans. But I would just say, put blinders on, stick to your vision and recognize what makes your business unique and really laser in on that and just try to stay focused on that. Because as somebody who has found myself you know, the world all last year, everyone was talking about inclusivity and I was like, oh, wow. So now it's trending. So like everyone cares. And I found myself feeling a little frustrated with that. And I was like, hold on, Deepika, this is actually a great thing. This actually means the whole movement is moving forward and you should see this as a positive. And this is what we stand for to our core. So I think whether your brand is, you know, we're vegan beauty, we're clean beauty, and you're scared because you're like, wait, now every brand is clean and vegan. That's okay. Because you have to focus in on what makes you true to your mission keep blinders on and um, yeah, no distractions. That is a great piece of advice. Final question, it's a little bit um, of a gratuitous question, but why are you excited to be a part of the Forbes Next 1000 inaugural list? Well, I'll tell you, this is actually a really fun story. <laughs> um, I missed the window for Forbes 30 under 30. I was in the height of building mode for Live Tinted. And I remember, um, just casually Googling and being like, oh, when is the submission for this? And I was 29 years old. So it was my last year. Um, and it was just a thing, you know, growing up, it was like a personal victory. It meant a lot to my immigrant father and things like that. Forbes is like a thing. I missed that window and there was no getting around it. Um, and, you know, I told myself, it's fine. One day we'll make a cover or something like that. And you, you've got to like hype yourself up. So being a part of this is actually even more meaningful because this is you guys supporting small businesses and really helping give us a spotlight. And I think that is what the world needs right now. And so what I love about this also is it really feels like a spotlight to live tinted rather than myself. And that really is just nice. Um, I, I, I feel like there's a whole team behind live tinted that makes it happen. And so um, I'm just really grateful. Thank you for having me. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Deepika. We'll leave it there. There are a lot of different ways to run a business. That's why with Square, you can run your business however you want. With all your tools in one place. You can sell online, take payments in person, and watch all your sales sync up. You always get your money fast, so your cash flow can keep moving. Right along with your business. No matter what business you're in. See all the ways we can help at Square.com. Before we move into our next panel conversation, you will see a poll in Slido. Tell us which of the following sales channels are most vital to your business. Select all that apply. A, online store or website. B, email marketing. C, TikTok. D, Instagram. E, Facebook. F, SMS. G, in-store or in-person. H, other. Now for our next session, Innovation Through Uncertainty, please welcome Gary Cooper, co-founder Rahipli. Pinky Cole, founder Slutty Vegan. Ashley Grick, global head of sales Square. Julia Nero, founder and CEO Milk Run. And welcome back, Manit Ahuja, Senior Editor, Forbes. Well, thank you, Juliana. And thanks to the audience for sticking with us. We have a terrific ro ro sorry, roster of rock star entrepreneurs here and all our next 1,000 honorees that were just announced. So let's dive right in. So let's start with a general, general question for all the entrepreneurs on the panel. But Pinky, let's start with you. You have an incredible story, becoming a pillar of the Atlanta community and a nationwide brand practically overnight. And by overnight, I mean 2018, so not exactly overnight, but pretty quickly for an entrepreneur's story since launching Slutty Vegan in 2018. But all businesses, big, small, and in between, have faced unprecedented challenges in the last year. How was your business impacted and what shifts did you have to make as a result? Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me, Winnie. Um, it's interesting because I've seen an increase in my business um, through the pandemic. And 
I know that there are many businesses that can't say that, but we actually have a demand issue because business has grown tremendously through the pandemic. So what I realized is I can remember last year in March when uh, businesses started closing and we started quarantining and we had to stay in the house. What happened was, is I was able to pivot and put more emphasis into my marketing. And I realized it continued to drive more traffic to my business. So when it was time for my business to open back up within two weeks, I've literally seen over 64% increase year over year. I've been able to open up three locations in the middle of a pandemic, and I'm opening another location now, uh, which will be my first location outside of Atlanta. So business has been very good. I've had an opportunity to focus on my operations, to revamp, bring in some C-level uh, executives, and really just identify ways to make my business better. And I'm, I, I couldn't be even happier about it. That's awesome. I mean, you already had such tremendous success going into the pandemic with major celebrities raving about your brand and eight-hour waits. I was watching yeah. on YouTube, people <laughs> waiting in line for eight hours for your burgers. But and they when, still do. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure they do. But when you talk about marketing and an effort to like help the audience with how they're thinking about their business, what marketing channels did you use? Um, so I literally used the things that are free, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, I just got really introduced to TikTok, but I've never paid for marketing for the life of the business, right? So everything that we do, it's really grassroots. I have a very creative marketing team and I like to move authentic in everything that I do. And we're very intentional. We do three things on the marketing side, okay? We make people laugh, we make people proud and we give them information. So if we can achieve those three things every day with the content, with a videographer, then we've achieved what the intention was supposed to be. And that's really to spread a message that we can help people reimagine food without pushing the agenda on people. So for, for, for the people in the audience who need help when it comes to marketing, you don't necessarily need a whole bunch of dollars to, you know, to market your business. If you're very creative, if you have people who are forward thinking, then you can literally come up with so many ways, especially TikTok, um, to find ways to uh, introduce your business to a new audience, whether it's your niche or whether it's people who have never heard of your business before. That's so smart. So Carrie and Julia, leading up to the next 1,000, we have had several conversations. I recall bothering both of you at all hours of the night, trying to learn about your business because I'm so fascinated. And you both shared some key ways that you were impacted. And similar to Pinky, um, had a tremendous amount of success on a high level. Would love to hear from both of you. Gary, let's start with you. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I at, at Reaply, one of the things that we try to do is use our kind of core technology, which helps organizations map out where physical things are and use that to help, uh, at least here in Chicago, Mayor Lightfoot uh, with PPE and sourcing PPE to small businesses and nonprofits who needed that PPE for a safe reopen back last summer, especially when there were six to eight week times on Amazon or in places uh, like Walgreens or 7-Elevens. So, you know, um, I'd never thought about using our technology for PPE. Uh, we use that typically for, uh, for big business industrial equipment and, and kind of tracing and tracking that. But of course we were able to use it there and, and thus we uh, saw kind of an increase, um, not only just in our revenue, but just in our engagement generally, which has been very exciting. You also were able to ride the tailwind of remote work, right? Yeah. As companies yeah. were shut down suddenly. Yeah. Can you explain a little bit about what Reaply actually is? As the way I described it in Forbes was a Google um, for physical assets, but I'm sure you have an, a better way to explain it. Uh, no, that's that's the way we think about it too, right? So the- Oh wait, Reaply I think I got that from you, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well great, either way. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm glad you're using, using that. So yeah, so what Reaply helps organizations do is, you know, let's even take a business like Google. They have tens of thousands of employees, hundreds of locations, billions of dollars of physical things that they purchase. It's really, really, really hard to trace and track all of that stuff across a big system. Now imagine all of those people go home and they work in their homes. So now they have Google property in their homes. It's even harder to track that. So our software has always been um, uh, designed to help 
on-premise organizations kind of trace and track all these things around, it certainly could do that in people's homes. And so to your point, we've also seen kind of a tailwind in our engagement in our sales because of this new use case of trying to figure out how to manage assets in a, in a either potentially remote or flexible workforce. And Julia, similarly, your business, Milk Run, was deemed an essential business uh, due to the pandemic. So it actually proved a boon uh, and you saw revenue grow. So I think 15x. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your experience and, and, and the mission of Milk Run and your personal story? Uh, yes, it's been quite a year. So we scaled, um, scaled an essential business um, in a pandemic and also faced some huge climate issues this year. Um, and what that meant for us, I mean, what a year. So I think March of last year, I was um, wrapping up tele or Techstars Anywhere Accelerator when um, I landed back in Portland, where our first city, we now are in three cities, Portland, Seattle, and Austin, Texas. Um, I guess I'll start a little bit of what we do, but at Milk Run, uh, we deliver goods to consumers' homes direct from local farmers. So it's a weekly grocery subscription service that delivers all locally grown and made goods. Um, and we became an essential business. We always have been, but the fact that we were now seen and really defined is that made all the difference. Um, and I remember kind of getting back to Portland and our business, it really actually grew the initial 10X in just eight weeks and um, kind of 15X throughout the entire year. It's been just, just, I mean, a tremendous acceleration of our plan. And we wanted to make sure that we made the moment matter. Um, and I mean, just, I remember getting a call from one of my investors who said, are you ready? And I was like, I I think so. He was like, you are going to have to learn what most CEOs have to learn in their entire careers in a matter of weeks. I just want to make sure you're ready. And then growth hit. And, um, you know, scaling an essential business at that time, it was a huge pivot. Everything from no contact delivery to now COVID safe procedures for an entire workforce. Um, this is also the time where all farmers across the country, the majority of them had lost their sales channels as soon as restaurants, corporations all closed. Um, so not only did our farmers uh, lose their sales channels, but I was getting calls from, from communities all across the U.S. How do we bring milk run here faster? 8% of farmers were selling online pre-COVID, 87% now are. And not only that, but from a consumer perspective, as well as more of the capital markets, finally, everybody was starting to realize the incredibly critical nature of our national food system, our small farms, and really the power of local supply chains. And so for us, the most important thing became, you know, we, we said as a team, listen, we can batten down the hatches and contain this and wait it out and do the, you know, really like just control the growth or we sprinted the cliff. So we went through Y Combinator. We opened two more cities. We moved down to Austin, Texas. Uh, so three now unique supply chains. We help over 250 different farmers. Uh, we raised our C round of capital. We're just now uh, closing out our series A. We're soon to be in Dallas, Texas. And then we have about five more markets right behind that. Um, so for us, it just became, how do we make this moment matter by accelerating our growth plan um, and, and making sure we can keep everybody safe and healthy and continue to do what we do best, which is serve people good food in a time of need. Yeah, I mean, I recall when I learned about your business, I was like, wait, why is not milk run in the New York City area? So um, I'm happy you experienced that growth. So come to the East Coast soon, please, okay? And no. also, uh, Pinky, I am dying for your burger cake. Can you FedEx them? I think I was on the FAQ on your website and it was, they were like, no, we don't ship burgers yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I'm actually coming. I'm actually coming to New York. Um, I'm doing a collaboration with Shake Shack on the 8th. So I will be there and we will have a vegan burger there. So come. Okay, I'm going to hit you up after this, but let's <laughs> head back to our poll results real quick. Um, so the question was, which of the following sales channels are the most vital for your business? Select all that apply. And it looks like an overwhelming amount of people said, online store website at 62%, followed by email marketing at 43%, and Instagram uh, at 51%. I know TikTok came up, but it looks like that got about 13% of the votes and Facebook at 32%. All right, so we're gonna go back to our discussion. So one of the key things that we've seen as a result of the pandemic has been an acceleration of shifting consumer trends, as we discussed just now, and behavior, something that's very typical during times of crisis. 
Ashley, you sit on the other side of the fence from our entrepreneurs as the head of sales at Square. What are some of the shifting trends that you've seen and how are small businesses successfully adapting to them? Thank you for having me today. And I just want to say like these, these stories from, from you all are incredible and really just illustrating like in times of constraint, there's an opportunity for change. Um, you know, starting in March of last year, like this time was long enough to change behaviors, uh, but it also in many ways accelerated behavioral changes and expectations. And so from the consumer side, um, we're seeing obviously a real shift to contact free commerce that includes in-person commerce being contact free. Um, consumers are expecting more options in the way that they shop. Uh, obviously the e-commerce boom will continue to raise the bar for consumer expectations for in-person shopping as well. Not only that it's relatively seamless, but also that it's personalized. They do want to be known. And we heard this before the pandemic that's really accelerated after. Um, and it, we, in our future of retail report, it, it really highlights that retailers, as they expand to online channels, they have the opportunity to connect their online and offline experiences. Mm -hmm. um, which it results in increased sales. We're seeing it in these uh, these business examples right here. But yes to ex expectations on contact-free contact commerce, absolutely we're seeing moves towards um, expectations on omnichannel or really merging online and offline worlds. But one thing that I really want to call out is you know, we hear it all the time. You see it on Nextdoor if, you're, if you dare to, to take time to read it. There's a real desire to support and shop local as well. So on the business side, you know, with the business, the square small business customers that we work with, our customers that are adopting our online options, um, QR codes, social media integrations, um, and customer messaging, like being able to confirm appointments and check inventory with customers via text, those tools, they're thriving. Like our, our businesses are, are, are doing really well. And so they're not only meeting their customers' desire for community loyalty, but they're also winning new customers through social uh, and online as well. Yeah, as I mentioned in our earlier conversation with Deepika, um, there's a lot of research coming out that says that small businesses that were able to effectively utilize digital tools saw, I think, a 400% increase in revenue as opposed to those that didn't. And so I think it's important to highlight the tools that are out there because I think, you know, running a small business in any environment is difficult especially during a pandemic. And a lot of times you get used to doing what's worked in the past. And if you had a brick and mortar business, maybe you didn't have a need to level up on your technology, but this environment provided an opportunity for that. So a lot of businesses we're seeing coming out on the other side are actually in a much better position financially and then just more agile overall. Um, but on the topic of running a small business, a big one is finances. And why not, uh, while not innovation related, staffing is a critical part of the equation for business success. And Julia, I know that you scaled an essential business during the pandemic. You did a ton of hiring, I think up from like four employees to 38. And Pinky, I noticed in a lot of your interviews, but I found really fascinating is you said that all of your hiring actually comes from Instagram and social media. And so I'd love to hear just really briefly a little bit more about how you both approached hiring and staffing during the pandemic. And so Julia, let's start with you. I mean, growth is challenging. <laughs> I'll just say that. Um, I think we can all be real here, right? This is about the real experiences of, of building a business. And um, I guess my goal is to be as transparent as possible, to make it as useful as possible. Um, and it's hard. And, you know, leadership and um, continuing to develop uh, teams and a culture, and especially through massive growth times, is not an easy thing. And we, we made some, some errors along the way, um, but I mean, Really what happened for us was, yes, we hired pretty quickly right out of the restaurant industry. So we were lucky enough in many ways because kind of the, the people within each of our communities and our markets who are uniquely positioned to best serve customers safely with a passion, experience, and, and really understanding of how to get this done, um, the workforce became somewhat available. And so the fact that Milk Run could become, uh, you know, people have lost their jobs. I mean, these were restaurant managers to some of the best fine dining restaurants in, in Seattle, in Austin. 
Austin in Portland who had lost their jobs overnight. And the fact that we could really give them a place to work and had that transition was amazing. And that they stuck with us over the year and all of them are retained now. Um, just because of the culture we were able to build and provide in the moment, we would never have been able to, to really scale or meet the demand without their knowledge. So it, it was just an incredible relationship. And I think ultimately it was that transition from when a business is all about the founder and the owner and when that starts. But I, I really was able to experience the amazing transition this year where Milk Run now is just is about Milk Run and the people behind it. It is much more than me or when I started it. And I got to really just see what happens now and what, what it'll be, what how Milk Run, um, the ethos and the foundation that'll take it totally forward where it is now about the team and the people who came together in 2020 to back it. Um, and that's an incredible thing. And we learned a lot of lessons along the way. Cool. So finance is a big area for founders, as I just mentioned, especially during the pandemic. And Gary, I'm curious to hear what investments have you seen maybe the best ROI on during the pandemic? Where have you doubled down and where did you reprioritize? Yeah, it's a great question. And I couldn't agree more with what Ashley was saying around how local business are even more important uh, in this moment and definitely during COVID and something that we see and we are investing in. For, for us, the, the investment is straight for a work climate tech company. We try to help organizations reduce waste um, and thus reduce global emissions. So we're, we're doubling down on our go-to-market teams and our marketing, as we've been talking about. Our marketing is a little bit different than most um, as we serve the enterprise. Um, and then we're doubling down on research. As it turns out, the solving some of the problems that a post-covert world presents, solving some of the problems that climate change presents are new problems. Mm -hmm. And not only do they uh, uh, need new technology, they also you have to understand what that technology should do. So we're actually doubling down as a tech company and trying to figure out the how before we solutionize the what. That makes a lot of sense. Going back to the staffing question, a great audience question just came in. So I want to layer that in here. What is the number one aspect that you look for as a trait in all of your employees when bringing them onto the team? Pinky, let's start with you because I know you have a good answer for this one. Yeah, so mine is really unconventional. So first of all, I do use Instagram to, to find my people. And Slutty Vegan is like any other, is unlike any other restaurant that you've ever seen. So like I'm particularly looking for people who are in alignment with the brand. So they don't necessarily have to be vegan, but they have to be conscious. They have to be forward thinking. They have to be people that love the brand because it gives us an opportunity to welcome people in that have stood in line before, that know about the brand, know what we represent, know about the ethos, know, know, know what we stand for. And those people they last longer in the business, especially because this is fast food, right? Um, so that's number one. Secondly, I don't want you working for my company if you only want a paycheck, right? I'm building an empire and I want people to be a part of that village to help that empire grow because I didn't start Slutty Vegan to make money. So if somebody is just specifically looking for a job, that's not the right candidate. That may be the right candidate for another company, but for what I'm working toward and my mission to really transcend the minds of people, it's, it's really necessary for me to bring in people who think like I think, who move like I move. Like my, my goal is to be able to, to create little me's and, and, and whether they're learning through Slutty Vegan or leave Slutty Vegan, they can utilize those tools that they learn at my business. So it's really like a leadership school. We call it Slutty University. So you're not just walking into a job. You're walking into a safe space where you can really grow with a family and there's a growth plan for you and you can be anything that you want to be. And if, if the energy does not feel right to me, then, then we just don't hire them, right? So it's really about the energy and the culture in the business. Um, we've tried using like the other major companies to, to bring people in. But what we notice is that oftentimes in the fast food industry, the, the, the lifespan of an employee staying at a company is about four to six months, right? Unless you can really pay them very well. But we have one of the most competitive salaries in the company. Um, we pay our employees tips and they get over $200,000 in tips a year, 
right? So not only are they working on a base pay, they also get tips. So that's another incentive for them to come to the company. But we create a safe space where we don't treat them like employees. We treat them like talent. So when we go out to look for people, we're looking for people that want to be on TV, that, that want to help people change their minds about eating vegan food. And they love it. And it really works. So our turnover rate is pretty low, um, which is a good thing, knock on wood. Uh, just recently, obviously, with the stimulus checks, we did have some people check out, but that's normal in any business, right? Um, right. But, for, but for the better half, Half of it, we really get people who like really stand for the company and love community and love veganism and what it represents. Yeah, I heard you say that on a different interview, and I was so fascinated by it. I think the way you phrased it was like, I'm not hiring you if you only want to work at Slutty Vegan. I'm hiring you if you have a bigger vision. People yeah. that say they want to work here forever, they're not, they're the opposite of who I end up hiring. So I thought that that was super cool. But what I also found super interesting about this panel is that all three of you founders have a very clear mission-driven businesses. Julie and Pinky, you're both on different ends of the equation about improving the food system and the food experience. And Gary, you are tackling the $4.5 trillion circular economy and helping businesses reduce their carbon footprint. I'd love to hear a little bit about having a mission-driven business impacted how you feel it it has impacted if at all your actual bottom line um so i don't know gary let's start with you yeah that was just my door ring at a very inopportune time um but um the uh our mission is drives every single decision and in fact the decision to even put, put together a, a platform that could move ppe between the it, actors in the city of Chicago was completely off of my product roadmap and nothing I'd ever talked to an investor about. But core to our mission is helping people get things in the actual world, right? And helping move value and helping and being helpful is actually one of our course value at Reaply is to be helpful. It's the thing we hire around, it's the thing we tell our customers, um, it's the thing that we tell our partners. And so I think you have to have that heartbeat, especially in times like COVID to kind of figure out like what is our North Star? What decisions don't we do? What decisions do we do? And so it's important for us, a world without waste, it's accomplishable. You need technology to do it, but you also need along the way, um, kind of this passion that you get up in the morning for, and that's just an ideal, idealistic world uh, that, that's embedded in our mission. Mm -hmm. Ashley, I would love to have you weigh in as well. I mean, do, do you see that that translates to the bottom line of the businesses that you're seeing come through that are using Square every day? Absolutely. I loved what Gary said about, about you know, making pivots that weren't necessarily on the roadmap, but made sense, especially for the mission of the company. And it's funny, before you had said, like, these are three really mission-driven companies, it's like, that is really what's jumping out in all these answers here. Um, as I think about sort of high ROI changes or, or approaches at this time, um, the first is, is to offer new and interesting ways to meet your customers' needs. So that makes sense for your business, right? And, and that could be a restaurant pivoting to meal kits, which we've seen uh, of our customer base during the pandemic, yeah. or, um, you know, becoming a channel for, for farmers markets and like, or, or directly for farmers, which I love that Julia is talking about here. Um, so first and foremost, it's it's finding new and interesting ways to continue to stay relevant with your customer base that make sense for your business, right? The second is is um, high ROI on improving web and e-commerce offerings, right? Mm -hmm. Selling online, 62% um, of revenue is expected to come through online channels uh, for restaurants and, that are using online ordering and takeout. And then amongst retailers, I believe it's like 58% of revenue now comes from online sales, which is which is pretty pretty staggering for SMBs. Um, and then social commerce, mm -hmm. right? That improving the web and e-commerce offerings like Instagram, you see that come up a lot. Um, Pinky talked about uh, TikTok, but I mean, 84% of retailers who sell online either already sell on social media or plan to this year. Um, the third the third high ROI investment that I would that I would say we're seeing and that I would recommend making is um, an investment in backend operations. And that's not that's not sexy. It's not what people see, but it's critical to the business. And I I know that like Julia thinks a lot about it. For example, um, you know we see that for for sort of kitchen display systems and order management and ingestion. Right? How, how many of you guys have walked into a restaurant and seen the the iPad farm? 
in the back, like right. all the iPads that are lined up with all the different order platforms. Like that just breaks my heart when I see that. Cause I'm like, it doesn't have to be that way. Like it absolutely doesn't. You can ingest all your orders from all different platforms right into your kitchen. So that's one sort of streamlining impact. And the other is real time inventory uh, technology and uh, 70, we found that 75% of business owners said that they're moving in that direction. Yeah, and as you mentioned, Ashley, these are not the most sexiest suggestions, but these are the ways that are going to help your business run more fluidly and seamlessly and ultimately save you money so that you can put money into the areas that you want to help scale your business, right? right. So it looks like we have a bunch of audience questions. We only have a couple minutes, so I'm just going to pivot myself in that direction. So first audience question, uh, when you have rapid expansion in your business, what tips do you have for getting out of your own way and becoming a bottleneck to business? Who wants to say, okay, Pinky, you go. Pinky. <laughs> I'm actually dealing with that right now. <laughs> um, well, first of all, um, what I'm learning about scaling is you have to be very strategic, right? Um, and scaling fast, right? Scaling up fast. So one of the first things that I did is I hired on a co-packer to be, be able to streamline all of my food um, so that now instead of having a whole prep team that's costing me a whole bunch of labor all day, every day, now we can rip the bag and pour right? And, and the experience is the same every single time you come to the restaurant. That's the first thing that I had to learn. Secondly, I had to make sure that my SOPs are like really on point because it really should be wash, rinse, and repeat. But those SOPs have to be so zip tight that it, a baby can come in and literally do everything that a grown adult can do. Um, and that is not always the easiest thing to do, right? Because things change in a business every single day. Like literally, I just changed the way we cut our onions. We had onion rings. And then I say, you know what? Let's chop them up. But then on the flip side, making sure as the CEO that I'm making all the right decisions, because of course we can all agree that like we all make decisions doesn't necessarily mean that they're all the right decisions, but we make the best decisions that we feel would take the business to the next level. And that is a part of getting out of my own way because, you know, I ran this business for the first year and a half with five people, right? So here I am now, there are 125 people in the company and I have to make sure that whatever decision that I make, I understand that it's going to affect a whole conglomerate of people. So as I scaled the business, making sure that those things are right, making sure that my, my HR processes are in place and that I continue to bring the right people in, which is the biggest thing that's going to grow my company, um, that's necessary. And, and like enlisting companies that are headhunters that can help you bring in those high level people that are proven to scale companies. Okay. That's a great thorough answer. Next question, Julia, I think this one's for you. Is an incubator program worth it? Hard, hard really to say. They're all very different, so it depends definitely on your goal. Um, you know, I was part of two, so Pi in Portland, Oregon, which was right, right when I started, which was um, an incubator experiment, so a local one, um, and it was tremendously helpful. Techstars, anywhere, amazing. Y Combinator, amazing. Um, all different functions, and it's really all about what kind of business you want to build and what kind of track that you want to take it on. So I think there are needs out or there are kind of does that program designed to help meet your needs depending on what you want, but everything comes down to what you want um, and what kind of vision you have and how you want to get it there. So I think being very clear on that and then committing to a program, but I think there are also some that are really, really, really distracting. Um, but I will say to that, that one of the points of them is they are distracting because as the CEO and founder, you have to learn to get out of your business or you will never scale it. So just the, this the fact that they take you out of your business and force you to do something else and hire and delegate uh, is usually always a good first step, if nothing else. Awesome. Gary, I'm going to toss this one to you. When you started your business, did you create a business plan? Uh, no. <laughs> when, when I started my business, I was a scientist, uh, you know, process person in a consulting firm. And, and what I did is I, I read books. I talked to founders who were already running companies. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe talked to, I, I remember talking to some founders who had had companies that didn't go so well and just jumped in full in. I think that's the only way you really can start at least, you know, a, a venture back startup tech company is I think you just start you know, writing an idea down a piece of paper, finding some people who might want to join you on this journey. And then you start thinking about, oh, what could this thing be? But every day we're learning. There's, there is a plan out there, but it's always being iterated on. 
Well, it looks like we just are out of time and I am so upset because I could spend another hour, two hours learning from you guys. This was such a fascinating discussion. So thank you to all of our next 1000 honorees and thank you to Square. Ashley, great insights, great insights from all of you. And I look forward to you um, continuing to grow with us as a part of our next 1000 family. And thank you for being a part of the inaugural class. Thank you and congrats to the uh, inaugural class. What a fantastic afternoon. Thank you again to our phenomenal speakers. If you are not following them on social media, I encourage you to do so as soon as possible. And thank you to our sponsor Square for their continued support of this intrepid group of entrepreneurs and for continuing to be a resource as they navigate a new world. This event is just one of many. So be sure to mark your calendars. Our next event is taking place on June 22nd after the launch of our second list on June 15th. Lastly, you will now see in Slido, be sure to take the post-event survey for a chance to win a $100 gift card. You must provide us with your first and last name in order to be entered into the drawing. Thank you all for joining us and being a part of this event. Have a great rest of your day. We are so grateful for your support.